Good evening, Cinema Ranger here. I thought I'd use this lovely setting to uh, talk about the latest film that I saw, Ad Astra. Uh, I thought it was a really strong film, it moved me quite a bit, and uh, I thought there was a lot there to analyze. Uh, for starters, just in terms of a mini review here, I thought, you know, like I said, it was a great film. It did have a few weak points. At times, the plot was a tad shaky. Some of the character motivations could have been described a bit better, and I didn't think the voiceover narration was essential to the story. Now, in terms of what worked, which I think was a lot, uh, on a thematic level, like I tend to do, uh, there was a ton to dig in there. Uh, and the main takeaway I had from the film is, you know, it's a space movie, but the further he goes out into space, the deeper he goes into himself. And there are several sort of waypoints on the way that each represent a kind of archetypical manhood or, or some sort of psychological turmoil. We'll start with one of the sort of the prevailing images that comes up early in the film, uh, Brad Pitt's character talks about needing to compartmentalize uh, his emotions or the, he feels like he has to compartmentalize his emotions. And uh, one of the very cool visuals we see throughout the film is he is routinely framed in boxes or window frames or door frames. And other characters are too, but mostly uh, the Brad Pitt character, the Major, uh, he is in these wonderfully designed closed spaces which echo that sentiment of feeling like he must compartmentalize his emotions or that's how he is sort of designed to do, which I think many men can relate to, that that idea that we sort of box up our emotions and, and put them in corners and things like that. The first major set piece in the film is this enormous antenna that he's working on. And the purpose of the antenna is to search for alien life. Uh, but to me, the thing that's sort of striking and, and vaguely disturbing about it is the t antenna has, you know, a sort of phallic presence to it. It's this enormous thing reaching into the sky and all these sort of men are working on it and, and I think given the film's preoccupation with the father there's definitely you know some Freudian implications to all of that. Uh, as he begins his journey one of his first stops is the moon and what I think is sort of evocative about the moon is it represents you know capitalism and machoism, car chases and gunfights and they even talk about it being kind of like the wild west and it's this sort of idealized machoism that plays out on the moon as these men vie for position over each other in this, in this sort of interesting gunfight. After that, he begins his journey to Mars. By the way, spoilers in this, in case you didn't know already. Uh, and on the way to Mars, they stop. It seems like a random sort of miscellaneous plot point. Like, is it really necessary? They find this angry baboon, this savage primal creature that's torn apart these scientists on a research vessel. But again, the real purpose of that scene is a symbolic one. Uh, the Major is confronting his rage. He talks about feeling angry or responding to things on this gut level of rage. And that is what the baboon represents, his confrontation with that internal rage. And yet there's still so much more journey to go. Uh, after that, we see incompetence, failure, anxiety. The astronaut who can't land the rocket uh, sort of teases this idea of insecurity with this feeling of not being able to live up to our potential, the pressures of, supposedly, the pressures of what it might be to be a man, or the expectations that are put on manhood uh, by ourselves or by the culture at large. I think Mars ends up being a very fascinating sort of symbolic location. Um, it's, you know, he stays in these comfort rooms and we see these flowers and waves on the wall and, and there he's sort of pampered but in a suffocating way. It's almost like the child being sort of overprotected by a parental type figure. Or, or being reduced to an almost infantile-like state where he's, you know, asked to sort of be comfortable at the expense of truth and knowledge and the, and the larger mission. And then a very stirring image as he, you know, makes the decision to continue on to Neptune, we see him swimming in this underground lake which has like an amniotic or womb-like quality, you know, he's, he's swimming through the dark and being reborn in a sense. Um, and that I think is a pretty stellar image as well. So, you know, deep symbolism, deeply rooted in sort of internal psychology, you know, some things are, are, are general, but a lot of masculine archetypes. Uh, the next one I think is pretty general. As he heads off to Neptune, he's alone, and he goes through that process of being isolated, of being cut off. You know, the deeper he goes into himself, again, the further he goes out, and then of course there's that stage which you must confront the utter isolation of the self. And then finally, of course, his father is waiting for him out there, and there's, I think, you know, deep religious subtext there, or at least deep potential religious subtext, because when he gets to the father, I think the thing that's sort of most jarring is that he's not maniacal, he's not this tyrant, he's not this abusive overlord, he's just kind of a broken old man with a failed vision. And I think for many men, like, that's one of the most difficult things to reconcile, is that their father is not some great hero or, 
maybe even this great tyrant or a bad person, but rather just kind of a failed shell of a, of a broken dream. The religious implications go on even further. There is no life out there, and, and on many levels I think you could look at this film as sort of a, a banner for atheism. Uh, there's nothing out there. Uh, oftentimes in films when a man is searching for a father, or anyone is searching for a father, you can easily extract a religious or spiritual mission out of that man's search for God. Here, our hero finds the godlike figure, finds that he's pathetic, and then finds that there's nothing beyond that. And, and I think that's something that resonates with me as well. The Major eventually sort of turns inward and realizes that he has to be mindful of his space, and so there's something very therapeutic about that. He has to live in the world he lives in rather than dream of worlds beyond. Uh, and I think that's pretty resonant. There is a sort of a paradox there because in order to have arrived at that principle that to, you know, he must be mindful of the space he's in, he had to go well beyond the space he was in. Uh, the journey outward reflects the journey inward, and even though that is paradoxical to a large degree, I, I do agree with it quite a bit. I think, you know, one of the reasons I eventually want to shoot some travel videos or get out there in the world and, and, and make films about places beyond my locale is because I think the journey outward does in fact take us inward and I think that can bring us therapy. It, it, it sort of gives us that breath we need to find the space we must occupy, the real space, our home I guess. I'm the Cinema Ranger, thanks for watching my video and I hope our paths cross someday.